I'm Chris Bateman, a healthcare journalist and former news editor at the South African Medical Journal. My guest this morning is Professor Kemantri Mudli, a family physician and bioethicist. She's the director of the Center for Medical Ethics and Law at Stellenbosch University. I'm very conscious of how divisive COVID-19 vaccination has become in this age of instant communication, in spite of, or perhaps because, it impacts at the very core of our physical and financial health. Kemantri, like many of South Africa's globally acknowledged clinicians, you've been in the trenches with all of this, first during the HIV AIDS pandemic, and now with COVID. Won't you please briefly outline your motivation for mandatory vaccination? I think the sheer numbers of deaths that we've been experiencing globally, including in South Africa, has been particularly concerning. As a healthcare practitioner, uh, having served in the public health system for more than 20 years, I'm very familiar with the limited numbers of ICU beds and COVID ward beds that we have currently. I know that the strain on the health system is simply untenable. Our healthcare workers are exhausted. They've been working tirelessly through waves one, two, and now again in wave three. And nobody's looking forward to a fourth wave. In order to reduce the number of people with serious illness, uh, to reduce the number of deaths and hospitalizations, we need to ensure that vaccine rollout occurs really quickly. Although vaccines are not perfect, they are the best tool we currently have in our box of prevention tools. I think you'll remember from the HIV days that we, dis we spoke about, you know, a a box of prevention tools to use uh, to protect people from uh, developing HIV and uh, also to, to minimize transmission and to minimize uh, illness. So likewise, uh, during COVID, it's important to consider the fact that we do have a toolbox of prevention uh, items that includes vaccines, masking, hygiene measures, physical distancing, etc. And it's really important that we apply all of these prevention measures as soon as possible and that everybody participates in this process. So having vaccines is critical. Uh, many different methods are being used to encourage vaccination, education, counseling, incentives. But vaccines are ultimately what we need and we need as many people vaccinated as soon as possible. And this is why a mandatory policy is essential in high risk environments and in all communal settings, because that is where we as individuals start to put other people at risk. And so to a large extent, you know, this, the need to get the disease under control as quickly as possible to prevent the virus mutating and to ensure that we do not have more vicious variants than the ones we currently have, a mandatory vaccine policy is absolutely critical. I mean, you know, we just have to look around us, you know, our, our, our own families, our loved ones. I think by this stage now, there, there, there's hardly a single listener here this morning or here that, that hasn't been impacted somehow. And, you know, financially, we don't have to stop to think very long to see how it's impacting on our economy with tourism. You know, it's a volatile field. Tell us some about some of the pushback you've had. And perhaps before you do that, a little bit of, of, of the legislative environment that supports your argument for, you know, that, that it is actually possible, that, that, that it is legally possible to have mandatory vaccination. Well, Chris, that's the first thing I looked at. You know, ethically, I was quite clear that it is justifiable. A mandatory policy is justifiable on the basis of public uh, interest and uh, saving as many lives as possible during this pandemic, where we know individual rights need to be limited. And so we need to be clear about this. I'm not suggesting that individual rights must be violated. I'm suggesting a limitation on individual rights, which is, which is critical during a public health uh, crisis. Now, legally, even the constitution allows for a limitation of rights, provided the, re the, the limitation is based in law and it's reasonable and it's the least restrictive limitation we can impose, etc. So the law in South Africa makes provision for a limitation of individual rights. 
as do a number of international declarations like the Syracuse principles developed by the United Nations. So globally, it's an accepted phenomenon that under special circumstances, such as a public health emergency, we may limit individual rights. We've already done this in South Africa with the Disaster Management Act, and we've had lockdowns, mandatory mask wearing, etc. So mandatory vaccination policies would also fall within the law in that respect. There's also an important part of the Constitution that talks about the fact that everyone has a right to a safe working environment. And this means employers, employees, clients who visit a business premises. So everybody has a right to a safe environment. And that means that vaccinated people in the work environment will not be comfortable having unvaccinated people working with them as they would perceive them to be at higher risk of contracting COVID and transmitting COVID within the workspace. So the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the National Health Act in terms of communicable diseases, we have numerous pieces of legislation and the Constitution that will allow limitation of rights under these circumstances and that will support a mandatory vaccination policy. Tell us about some of the pushback you've had. I mean, how do you navigate this minefield? I mean, we seem to be having a stronger, more and more volatile public discourse around this and social you know, media is instant. There's been increasing polarization. We've even had our top clinicians and scientists at one another's throats, not necessarily on vaccination, but on, on the whole COVID rollout. So, Chris, when my, art, my article was first published on mandatory vaccination in the conversation over a week ago, I had tremendous amount of positive feedback from members of the health profession, members, you know, other bioethicists in the country, members of the legal profession who are experts in constitutional law. So the positive feedback has been tremendous, support from the public as well, from people who desperately want everyone in society to be vaccinated. Now, needless to say, there has been some negative feedback as well from a, a wide variety of anti-vaxxers. And, and mostly, none of them are able to advance uh, clearly formulated arguments based in science to support their position. And this is the type of misinformation that is circulated uh, by people with low health literacy, lo poor understanding of science, poor understanding of drug development and clinical trial regulations, who also have a paranoia around the pharmaceutical industry. Yet many of these people are also using a wide variety of medication manufactured by the very same manufacturers uh, you know, of COVID vaccines today. So a great deal of confusion coming through. And so this is it's important that, you know, we continue with education initiatives that correct the misinformation that is circulating widely on social media uh, in a very irresponsible manner. Uh, it's a, it's a, to a large extent, uh, you know, a matter of some people in society simply wanting to have their own way and not wanting to be, to be guided or told that uh, certain health measures need to be implemented for their own good. The funny thing about the anti-vax movement is that as long as they continue resisting and encouraging others to refuse vaccines, the virus is just going to spread rampantly. And we are going to go into vicious cycles of a fourth wave, a fifth wave, a sixth wave, etc. Not only is this having a negative health impact on all in society, so those with COVID and those with other non-COVID illnesses in terms of access to health care, but it is also having a negative impact on the economy driving unemployment. And so these multiple effects in terms of health and the economy are simply being perpetuated by the very people who are fighting against lockdown and who are fighting against the economic impact and against the ability you know, that COVID imposes in terms of socialization. So if we all want a better future, it's in, our, it's in the interest of all to try as much as possible to adopt the prevention measures that are available in terms of vaccines and masking, etc., and to assist in bringing this pandemic to an end. 
it's okay. at the end of the day, it will be a win-win situation for all of us. Yeah, I, I absolutely hear that. And, and then it comes to the question of pragmatics. Um, is it realistic to put mandatory vaccination in place when, it seems to me, and I'm being a bit of a devil's advocate here, the, the anti-vaxxers, not to mention any half-baked political party or mischief maker, can potentially seed social chaos? I mean, we only have to look at what happens when COVID-aggravated frustration and poverty are stirred up around a perceived injustice like the jailing of, of Jacob Gettlinger's Zuma. You know, what can be done on a practical level? Mm-hmm. So I think we need to look at specific environments where risk is important, such as um, hospitals. So all healthcare workers in hospitals, if they have not yet accepted a vaccine on a voluntary basis, and they've had more than six months to do this, um, you know, to, to ensure that we enforce some kind of mandatory vaccine policy at that level. So for healthcare workers who have a duty to themselves, to society, to their patients, to their families to ensure they have a vaccine. Then there are people who work in homes for the aged and, uh, and, and the disabled. And here again, these are high risk populations. So we need employees in those environments to, to have a vaccine. Um, then there are a number of different communal settings uh, like gyms and restaurants, uh, university campuses, uh, where people congregate, shopping malls, etc. And wherever there are many people that need to be in the same space at the same time, we need prevention measures in place. So requiring vaccines, you know, at those particular venues is important. It's not really difficult to, to um, implement. It's been done around the world. And yes, there has been some pushback. So we've seen the protests in France, etc. But they die down after a while and people accept that you need in the U in Europe, you need a green pass to in France to enter a restaurant or to enter uh, other similar venues and people accept and adopt it. So there will always be some pushback, but one needs to persist with the implementation of a mandatory policy as long as it's in the public interest. And with COVID, we know that it is in the public interest. So you're not in cabinet, you're not on the, the presidential advisory committee to the health minister. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so what's taking it so long? I mean, what, why has this not happened to date? Well, there's a vaccine MAC that is in place, um, as you've pointed out, and this is exactly the type of discussion that ought to be happening at the level of the vaccine MAC. Uh, whether the Department of Health will accept the advice of the vaccine MAC is a different matter altogether. But there is absolutely no reason why we don't have a mandatory vaccine policy in place already for specific high-risk environments. It didn't take too long for the UK to implement this type of mandatory policy for all health workers in the National Health Service. So in other parts of the world, uh, the ethical issues were resolved, the legal issues were resolved, and policy was simply implemented. So in South Africa, we sometimes suffer with a bit of decision paralysis. Mm -hmm. And it's because many people do not correctly understand the Constitution. They fail to see that the right to life is a significant right that must be balanced against other rights, like the right to bodily integrity and the right to religious freedom, and that in a crisis, the right to life takes precedence. You know, this is, a, this is really important, that there must be a good understanding of the Constitution. Because if we fail to understand the Constitution correctly, then we are hesitating to implement policy, you know, for the wrong reasons. Yeah, uh, so I, this, I, is, this is it. Yeah. I, it, it's, yeah it's, it's a very hard argument to counter. Um, and yet, you know, emotions and politics get in the way. I mean, you know, we, we've seen how the Constitution can be flouted by a former president, you know, blatantly. Um, and, uh, you know, some people say it's a lovely, it's probably one of the most progressive in the world. But, you know, how much are we living it? How much are we breathing it? And in this case, when it seems to me, and having covered politics for a while, that, that the government are, are, are scared. I mean, it seems to me that they are politically afraid of grasping the nettle. What's your take on that? Well, the, the hesitancy, you know, is understandable to a certain extent, given uh, the history of 
sort of the human rights agenda in South Africa, the history of apartheid, etc. Mm -hmm. But it is the responsibility of the current government to understand that there's a public health crisis. We're, we're you know, over the apartheid days uh, in South Africa now for many decades. We are dealing with the public health crisis. We need to see it for what it is and choose the correct strategies to bring this pandemic to an end. And if it requires limitation of rights, then there must be no hesitation in doing that. We had no hesitation in implementing lockdown, uh, isolation, quarantine. There was the Disaster Management Act. So simply to include vaccines where necessary uh, in terms of high-risk environments and communal settings is simply an extension of everything else we've done to bring our pandemic under control. The government has done a great job in procuring vaccines. So we now have a very good supply of vaccines, but we need to ensure that we do not waste even a single dose of those vaccines, that we ensure that they get into arms as quickly as possible, and that people get on with employment and rebuilding the economy. So it's in the best interest of the government and the country to have a good mandatory policy in place and to ensure that people are, are healthy and are safe and can return to uh, employment and other activities as soon as possible. So, so perhaps just to wrap up, we, we're running out of time. Um, there, just give me your first top three checkpoints. I mean, we've got on the one hand, do we start with vaccine hesitancy or do we start with mandatory vaccine or do they go hand in glove? They need to ha occur in parallel and we must not forget the terrible negative impact at the moment on the healthcare system and our healthcare workers. You know, we're getting into a position now where healthcare workers who decided to serve humanity by providing healthcare are developing compassion fatigue. And that is a huge threat to, you know, future health, our access to health services and the quality of healthcare that we may receive. People are simply exhausted within the healthcare setting. And that is a major threat to all of us. So we need to ensure that we have some level of respect for the healthcare providers who've made innumerable sacrifices for the past 18 months. And we need to play our part by getting a vaccine, cooperating, continuing with our prevention measures, masking included, and hope that we will all be in a better place in the months to come. I, I cannot help but think of, of, of dear old Archbishop Desmond Tutu and, you know, a person is a person through people. And I think if ever we've had a, a, a challenge in terms of that, um, it's got to be COVID because th there's no escaping uh, our common humanity. Um, Kemantri, thank you so much for your time. I think you've, you've added a, shed a lot of light on, on, a, on a volatile question. And uh, I think it's going to give the, 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 the debate, it's lifted the debate. So thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully talk again down the line. Perhaps we can even go into um, some incentives, uh, which you are, are well up on, on how, how we can get people, incentivize people to get vexed. But for now, Kemanthi, thank you very much. Um, this is Chris Bateman signing off for Biz News Radio. Thank <laughs> you.